and welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Frank Hubing. Frank is Vice President of the Western European Market Cluster for Simrise, a $6 billion B2B supplier of food ingredients, scent, and flavor products. He is a result-driven, compassionate leader who has a successful track record of delivering profitable growth. He has dedicated his life to doing good from farm to fork, beginning with his family's farming background to making a positive impact in the industry through successful leadership. I am excited to have him on the show to learn how you can provide great leadership in a corporate environment. So Frank, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, John. It's a pleasure to meet you and uh, I'm excited to have you on the show. We tend to not have a lot of corporate people. We have a lot of former corporate people, uh, but um, you being in a big corporation, I think you can give us some interesting perspectives. So that's why I was excited to have you on the show. Um, and so let's get started with, uh, for people who aren't familiar with Simrise, tell us what the company does and what your role is in the company. Yeah, I think uh, Simrise can probably be conceptualized in three different ways. Uh, if we look at it formally, we would say like pretty much what you said in your introduction, John, that we produce our fragrances, flavors, cosmetic and food ingredients. And uh, our company has grown from a small German company really to a global leader turning around six, $6 billion. And our customers are all the producers of brands, consumer brands, uh, consumer foods, food and beverage products, dietary supplements, and pet food. Um, but also, I, I think more visually, like uh, you can think of a supermarket. And when we walk into a supermarket out of, let's say, typical Walmart stores, I don't know how many SKUs in the food and beverage section there would have 15,000, uh, we would play a role in about 12,000 of them. So in literally every aisle of the supermarket, we would find customers of ours, products of ours, where we with our ingredients and play a role. And then you could think of our business also as a consumer during the day. So you'd wake up in the morning, you'd go in the bathroom, you'd probably brush your teeth and there would be a mint flavor in, in your toothpaste there and uh, whatever products you use, they would be scented. So we'd play a role there. Then you would have a coffee for breakfast, maybe in some some cereals there where we would play a role with our ingredients. Then we, we would go on to have a, a lunch and dinner and probably give some food to your cat during the day or your dog. So in all of these product and branded products, we could play a role. We, maybe not in all of them. Obviously, we have competitors, but uh, I think uh, we're very, very close to people's lives. So you're the you're the brand behind the brand, a brand that you don't typically see. So where does that yes. mean come from in toothpaste? Who knows, right? You're <laughs> likely one of those one of those people that supply. Yes, correct. Right? Yes. Yeah, man. excellent. So a very important part of our eight day to day living uh, is having those uh, components that make up our final products, uh, final consumer products. So very important um, role and important uh, company. And what do you do specifically in that role? Um, yeah, I, I lead uh, the country's uh, country organizations of, of the UK and Ireland, France, Spain, Italy, and uh, um, and Portugal. And uh, basically, that means uh, we've got uh, an organization of about 350 people. I think it's eight countries, it's seven sites, uh, two factories. And by and large, we serve the food and beverage uh, manufacturers in these countries and uh, the global key accounts who have their production sites there. We work on their innovations, their developments with them and uh, basically make sure that they can produce and we're part of their supply chain. And uh, yeah, it's a very international and interesting job. Yeah, it's a very a high level responsibility. A lot of people, a lot of uh, moving parts. So, So my question to you is, what gets you out of bed to do your job every day? What's your motivation? What, to, what, you know, what's your why in, in, in doing what you yeah. do? My why is that uh, in, a, in, in a way, um, probably your listeners may have asked yourself, uh, well, Simrise, who's that? Never heard of that company. But then what I just said about the supermarket, uh, I think it's uh, my why is really we're touching so many lives of so many people every day globally in all countries around the world. And uh, 
I think that's that's a fantastic motivation. So like uh, whenever going into a supermarket or whenever sitting at a dinner table, like there are products there that we somehow are connected with them and we touch people's lives. And that's personally very, very motivating for me. And uh, the other um, idea, since we have a very complex business, uh, I think uh, we need a special style of leadership to empower people to work in our company to deal with that complexity because it can't be command and control. That wouldn't really work. So we've got a lot of opportunity to develop people and that's what I'm really passionate about. Mm, well, that's good. Let's speak about leadership and, and, um, and being able to, you know, um, not have a command and control style in a, in a company as complex as yours. What are some key milestones in your personal development and your leadership journey? How did you end up being, how did you end up in the role that you're in today? I think what very much defines me, and uh, you mentioned you don't have so many corporate leaders. I'm in my 50s, in my early 50s, but yeah, it uh, supposedly gets tougher yeah, when you uh, continue in your career to keep up the corporate rhythm. So I think it's very, very important to be in the right company. See, like... Uh, my uh, family is a farming family, so I grew up on a farm. And uh, in many aspects, Simrise is connected to agriculture because our raw materials come uh, from that environment. So there's a very clear connection there. I think growing up on a farm really instilled me a sense of humility and um, yeah, hard work. And if you want to achieve something, you need to work hard. There's always an environment that tries to obstruct what you're trying to achieve, the weather, uh, the wind, the sun, either too many, too much rain, not enough. So that always happens in a farming environment and you try to control the uncontrollable, which not really is possible. So I think hard work and a sense of humility like really uh, made a mark there. And then I think uh, after my studies, I had started work at Mondelist, um, big uh, global yeah snacking company and uh, I think uh, I was very very fortunate to learn a lot in that company and I laid the foundations for my my technical skills I would say I had great mentors then later in my life I went from Germany to Spain not knowing the language I was lucky enough to find a family business uh, Chupa Chups I may know the lollipops that uh, wanted to take me on board oh yeah and yeah. That for me was completely stepping out of my comfort zone to go to a, a new culture, not speaking the language and uh, yeah, finding my way around there. I then co-founded uh, a startup company in Spain as well. And after that, uh, I think what also was an important milestone was an MBA at a top school. Yeah, and obviously the last 15 years in the flavor and food industry and uh, involved in a broad range of, of food and beverage businesses. So I would say like uh, my origins, the learning journey throughout my life and uh, simply like being in an industry that I feel very, very connected to. That, that makes a lot of sense. And that's sort of been a thread through your career is the food and beverage side of things. What's interesting is what you said in terms of your your where you came from, this farming background, you know, you talk about hard work and humility. You know, the other thing is like, like farming is difficult. It's really hard. And uh, you have to have perseverance. You have to be able to overcome setbacks, right? Like you said, the weather, uh, your, the price of the commodities, they, they fluctuate wildly and you can have a, a successful year just based on luck. Uh, you know, the way the pricing of the, of the, of the products are going. So I think you bring perseverance into the equation. And then what I love about your story is that you've done difficult things, right? Some people say, oh, I'd like to be a vice president of the company. What do I need to do? Well, you need to go to a country where you don't speak the language and do a job that's very much outside your comfort zone if you want to get those opportunities to do more and more responsibility. So we we tend to want to stay in our comfort zone, but it's really where we where we grow is when we step outside that comfort zone. It sounds like in your career, You've made those choices to step outside your comfort zone, even starting your own business, which again, these are difficult things. And, um, and again, it's given you opportunity to expand your reach as a leader, it sounds like. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, also, if you think about uh, how to make your mark in a company, I think it's uh, many times uh, going where nobody else wants to go, right? Yes. It's uh, like if yeah. there's a job on offer, 
and uh, an assignment on offer that really looks not so attractive, uh, very hairy, very difficult and challenging, then it's probably the gem of a career opportunity for personal growth, which I think for me is uh, probably much more important than career growth because career growth is a consequence of personal growth in my view. Um, but yeah, go where uh, nobody else want to go. Yes, yes. I absolutely love that. Uh, and that's where you're going to get those opportunities to showcase your talent and, and to learn and grow. So great, great advice. Speaking of advice, what are, what's, what's one of the best career advice that you've received in your career? What's, what's some advice that's really helped you? Yeah, I think it was a very, a very probably from a position now, funny piece of advice uh, from a director, a fantastic marketing director that I worked for at, uh, craft foods, which today is Mondelez. Yeah. So like, uh, I was a brand manager, young brand manager on a soluble cocoa brand in the German market. And we were tracking our weekly market share in the market. And I had uh, came in, market shares would come in on a Tuesday morning. I still remember that. So like I was looking at my market share and they had plummeted from the 35, 40% that I was used to, to 25%. I thought, oh my God, the world is going down. I don't know what's happening here. I'll probably get fired. So I was really, really upset. And I walked up to this gentleman and said, look, this is happening. And he told me laughingly and said, don't worry, Frank, your brand will easily survive 10 bad brand managers. I said, what are you saying? I'm a bad brand manager? I said, no, it's just so robust right? Yeah, yeah. Breathe, move on and just work your way forward and things will be okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. I think you're right. Like don't let one little setback and you know, it's just a setback and what can you do to, to, to turn it around? And where in some cases, like you said, the brand's so big that, you know, how much, how much impact am I going to make <laughs> in, a, in a given year? So I love that I- idea because I think we do Especially when I when I work with young managers, they tend to the you know they anything bad happens it's the end of the world and I think what what you know from being in as experienced as you are and, and I'm 56 as well is we've seen it all we've seen we've seen every bad thing that can happen and usually things work out given time and given energy and given focus so I don't let big things bother me as much as I, I used to when I was younger so I think that's a great piece of advice you got in your career. Yeah, and I think the world just doesn't fall apart, right? And it may seem very, very bad, but uh, I mean, I see in your background, uh, there's a lot of uh, naval, military uh, 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 visuals there. And I think uh, um, when something really exciting happening, and I, I had to learn that only in the last five, six years, so like uh, um, to re- resort to breathing, right? The box yes. breathing, yes. four in, four hold, four out, four hold. And the perspective changes on whatever challenge you have in front of you. So like, uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, what I was fortunate to learn from military leadership and it's, uh, it's a fantastic technique to get a refreshed perspective on the world. Yes, absolutely. Box breathing is something that I do too. And it, it sort of quiets the mind, quiets the noise, quiets all the voices so that you can focus. Uh, you know, deep leadership listeners have heard this before. I use box breathing before I, I turn the camera on and meet my guests because I'm running a business and I've got a million things going on. And so for me to be focused on my guests and, and to learn from them, I know I've got to turn off all those voices. So box breathing, uh, listeners is a great, uh, technique to, to quiet the mind and, uh, get focused. So, uh, it's a great technique. I'm glad, glad to hear other people have used it as well. So great, great process, great technique. So one of the things that's interesting about your background and where you're at today in your role is you're in a big company, um, $6 billion company, um, you know, lots of moving parts. Um, so how do you make an impact, um, as a person, as a leader in a big company? Because I think sometimes we talk, we talk to a lot of entrepreneurs where, okay, your leadership style is going to reflect in the organization because you are the boss. You're, you're running the whole show, right? And mostly these are smaller companies. My company is small. Um, Leadership is, I would say, easy because I control everything. I don't have any bosses, right? So I'm my own boss, so I can run things the way I want. But I've worked in corporate. I've had bosses. I've had um, 
uh, mandates that come from above that I don't necessarily agree with. Uh, I have problems that I have to sort out, people that I have to fire, uh, people I have to hire that I don't want to that are, that are being come from another division or what have you. So how do you do it? How do you make an impact as a leader and a professional in a big company uh, like Simrise? Yeah, for me, to start with, John, I think it's very, very important to feel that I'm in the right company. And mm-hmm. that's uh, largely like in this particular case uh, with uh, my company, Simrise, is a very strong connection to my roots. Uh, I think what I mentioned before, but then mostly uh, coherence of my personal values with the corporate values. Yeah, I feel that's very much in sync. And I think that's the basis uh, for everything. And then even the, like these challenging assignments you get from the top, you can calibrate them and you you know and find the right way to to pass them on yeah? because they would be like, I'd say mostly in sync with the values, my own values and the corporate values. And I think that's the basis for all. I think for me, the second focus would be to focus on the growth of my teams, my organizations and the talent within uh, my organizations because eventually they do the work. They do all the hard hauling, if you will. And uh, if they know that they are supported and if they know that there's a perspective for them, they go the extra mile and uh, take everyone along with them. And thirdly, I think it's what I mentioned before. I mean, you need to be willing to go where no one else wants Mm -hmm. to go, right? Because that's where the biggest opportunities are, even in big corporates. I love that. And one of the things you said that really stands out is alignment. So a lot of times people say, oh, I could never work at a big company. And and, and the point is you can if it's aligned with your goals and your vision um, and, and, and what you want to do in the world. So and if it's a brand that you really, truly believe in and it's a company that um, lives up to its, um, you know, it, it, its actions reflect its promise, right? So if you're in a company like that, and I was for years, I absolutely loved it. It was completely aligned with who I was. What happened for me, at least in corporate life, is that they went in the corporate went in a different direction, and I stayed the same. And suddenly, um, all the things that I was praised for uh, in, in in that company were now looked looked wasn't looked uh, people didn't like it anymore. So we were we were praised for independent leadership, and then it got to where no, they wanted us to toe the line. And for me, it was like there there was a divergence, but it wasn't that I myself changing, but the company changed. And when you find yourself in a position like that and you're living, you're you're acting different from your principles, it really is stressful. And it sounds like what you have is you have alignment, which which reduces your stress because you're doing what you've been put on earth to do. I think when we do that, we get a lot of satisfaction. Yeah, I completely agree, John. And I I think... uh it is still very important, like what you said is probably like uh, even more important than to feel alignment, uh, to feel when you're not aligned, right? Yes, and then yes. you tend to rationalize, you tend to think, wow, this is a fantastic company, like it's uh, among the 50 most successful or biggest or uh, most highly evaluated with biggest market capitalization in the US, in Europe, wherever. And you t- try to rationalize for yourself why you should fit in. Yes. Mistake in my personal view. I mean, it's happened to me before and Mm -hmm. I've been in a situation where I've stayed on too long trying Mm -hmm. to rationalize what's going around and trying to fit in. If you feel it's not for you and it's not in sync with your values, I think you should plan differently. Yeah. Be honest, have a candid conversation with yourself and say, is this really my place or do I need to move on? Yes. Yes. I've experienced the same thing myself. I stayed way too long. Again, trying to make it work, trying to rationalize it away, um, thinking, you know, it, it'll get better. It never did. And uh, and so uh, I found better alignment as an independent, you know, as a, as a owning my own company. Uh, and I think we have to find the place where it fits better for us. And uh, for me, it's been this, but for others, it may be different. So what, 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 you know, get, get to yourself aligned. If you can get aligned, uh, life gets much better for you. The stress level goes way down, I can guarantee you. But for those listening in, wondering if it's true, yes, it's true. Stress level goes down when you're doing what you enjoy uh, and and it aligns with your values for sure. Um, so in your experience, we're talking leadership, what does good leadership look like? 
Yeah, I think there's a whole host of literature on that. For me, it's a very simple combination of essentially two things. I think good leadership achieves results, right? Whatever that means, uh, it should be measurable in whatever the context is, but you get from A to B, you get something done and you build something. I think uh, that's one part. The other part for me is uh, good leadership creates an environment uh, where people want to be part of group and they feel a belonging and they feel they have an impact and they can make a contribution. And uh, talking about big organizations, that psychological safety, I think, uh, needs mm. to be measured as well. People need to reflect that. It cannot just be preached. And then I think, uh, yeah, the basis uh, for good leadership is good self-leadership. I think you need to be very honest with yourself. <laughs> You need to have a support network. Uh, in my case, I'm really, really lucky that my wife supports me with my career. I support her as well, but we mutually support each other. I think that's very important. I think the family needs to be there, whatever your family might look like or your group, int most intimate group might look like. You need support because uh, leadership requires sacrifice and uh, it requires sacrifice sometimes and many times of the nearest and dearest. And they just need to support your journey and uh, there needs to be something in for them as well. Mm, excellent. Well, listeners, you probably have heard these themes uh, reflected many from many of our guests. And so these are great. You got to get results, right? At the end of the day, if you don't get results, why are you there, right? So that's, we talk about that a lot. It's about people creating a great environment. You mentioned uh, psychological safety is very important. Building an atmosphere where people uh, I feel like they can make a difference and they can contribute. All these things are really important. And then I love it, you know, like the uh, the cherry on top of the Sunday is self-leadership, which is you got to take care of yourself uh, and make sure you have that support network. It's very important, especially too, I would say entrepreneurs, if you, if you don't have a support network, I tell you, you need one because uh, you're going to be doing things that you've never done before and that can be difficult and stressful and you have to have that good support network. I mean, it's, you got to maintain your relationships with your family, take care of them, have that time off and reset, refocus, eat well, exercise, you know, be, you know, take care of your financial uh, side of things. So these are all really critical for self-leadership. So excellent, excellent story. It's good to hear. It's good to hear what you talk about, which is consistent with our other guests. So that means that when you're leading in a big corporation, like you are, it means the same things that make you successful as an entrepreneur, as a, uh, as if you might be, you know, uh, leading up a, a fire station or a police department or a military outfit. Uh, they're all very similar, very similar. And it's, and so if you, you can practice these things, you're going to get better as a leader. So, um, question for you, what are some, maybe some of your top, top three principles or some of your top principles for great leadership? I think uh, very simple for me, as you probably have picked up by now, I'm very people focused and that's my key pillar of achieving results as well. So like number one, be trusting mm. and uh, to care for your people and uh, to work very, very hard to provide clarity and as a consequence, psychological safety. I think then to be transparent yeah, and show also where you have stresses and uh, vulnerabilities and uh, um be transparent with your people and finally be bold, right? Mm -hmm. uh, people don't want to follow somebody that uh, I believe that, uh, yeah, you need to paint a positive picture of the future. And uh, and that especially with the challenging times that we have at present requires uh, simply to be bold. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I, that's what I was going to ask you a little bit too. With, you know, you're, you're, you and I are similar ages, you know, what, what, changes have you seen? Uh, and then what would you say are, are skills and attributes that are really necessary for people who aspire to be leaders now and in the future? Because there's a lot of things have changed from when I started in, in leadership. And so maybe some ideas of what people need to have for skills and attributes as the world is changing. What skills and attributes? Yeah, like I think uh, personally, the big change we've been seeing maybe even in the last five years is uh, much more towards um, quote unquote, the soft skills of leadership. Yeah. Um, 
I think uh, that doesn't replace like the basic uh, uh, instruments and tools that any good leader needs to have. And I think uh, where to start with that, personally, I would like, I like to work with um, um, a tool set that is called Compass from the Creative Center of Leadership. That's basically a big book uh, listing like uh, all the qualities, the skills and attributes that uh, you, you need to develop in yourself and with your teams. And I think they're especially what they call the big four, which is communication, influence, self-awareness, and learning agility. I think these are indispensable. And uh, I think uh, we've seen throughout the pandemic uh, and uh, with, uh, let's say, the global complexity that we have, there's more and more the need to, yeah, to be trusting, to empower people in organization and essentially give up control for leaders. And I think that requires fundamentally different conceptualization of leadership, which is much more on the quote unquote softer side. Uh, so we now see meditation becoming very, very important uh, as, a, as a means to to to, to self-leadership and, uh, yeah, diverse leadership teams, yeah, so gender diversity. I've, I think my last three leadership teams in Samurais have been uh, equally uh, gender diverse to equal proportions. Uh, they've been more and more culturally diverse and also socially diverse. And... Uh, as a result, I think uh, sometimes I'm the most challenged person in the room, being the boss of the group but, here. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say that. That's um, that's. I was just curious because that's that's one of the things I'm thinking. You know, so again, being similar ages, have you? You know, I think it might be more natural for young people to just this is the way they they've always had it, right? But for us, what what are some of the, maybe the some of the challenges as a as an older leader? Yes. To, to, yes. Yes, I let let me give you one example. Like <laughs> what I love in Simras, we've got so many great young talents. And uh, when I joined the company, it was all about millennials. That's about mm -hmm. 11, 12 uh, years ago. And uh, really had to learn how, quote unquote, every person is a person, but how millennials work because they were asking, what's in for me if I take this position? If I take this job, what does it do to me? I uh, tended to say, what a weird question that is. It's a brilliant <laughs> opportunity. It's the right thing yes. for you to pick up and run with that, right? Yeah. I think that's how we were socialized in corporate life when we probably started our careers. But uh, I've learned that really these questions are the only relevant ones. Yeah, yes. And uh, I'm very, very grateful to learn this from the younger generations. I think, uh, I think when we started out, it was much more command and control. This yeah. is your assignment. This is your job. Here's the job description. Now go and get some results. Wouldn't work today anymore. So like today there's a conversation on why this mission is important, why this project is important. We already say why, why, why. And it can take a lot of time, but uh, once that is clear, and I think once that conversation uh, has happened with teams and with people, they are equally committed and they are equally empowered and motivated and run with it. So like, I think that's probably the biggest difference that I would make out when we started our job lives in the 1990s towards today. And I think it's definitely changed for the positive. Definitely. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, I, I'm glad you said that because I think a lot of people complain about millennials, but for me, I was like, oh, we can think about ourselves because it was always, it was always, you just do what you're told and you hope for the best, but you, you didn't, you, you know what I mean? You, you were not selfish. We were always giving and, and we saw our, our fathers, you know, uh, work 30 years or 40 years for one company and get the gold watch. And the millennials are saying, well, what's in it for me? And, and, uh, we, at first we were offended by it, but then eventually we went, Hey, wait a second. <laughs> that actually makes sense. Right. So, yeah, I do think that uh, for me, at least, same thing. I, I learned from millennials. I'm learning from younger people. And uh, and I think they've got some great uh, insight. And and those who are bashing younger people, I don't get on board. I think they've helped us uh, become better leaders because we are taking care of people better. So, yeah. Yeah, and I agree. And I would say being a father of two teenagers, which is even more challenging at present, yeah, it's not like... Uh, Bashing young people is simply missing learning opportunities, right? It's yes. not always convenient, mostly not, but uh, it's uh, definitely worthwhile. Yes, absolutely. 
Well, we're getting close to the end of our time. I was going to ask you, what final message would you like to leave with our listeners who've been listening in, have been hearing your story, hearing your journey? What kind of final message would you like to live, leave with our guests? Yeah, I think you made a few comments about the similarities of leadership in, uh, let's say, different disciplines and uh, different situations. And I think uh, I would also like to echo that. I think uh, leadership is... Uh, is a self journey. I think uh, is not always easy. It's uh, and leadership comes in many forms and shapes. And you can be a class speaker at school. You can uh, take responsibility in a sports team and uh, as a captain and maybe as a coach. Uh, uh, you can be a, a di director in a big corporation or a CEO in a startup. I think there are many many opportunities. Leadership comes in all different forms of shape. It requires sacrifice. It requires, uh, I think, if you truly want to be um, a successful and uh, sustainably successful and leave a legacy uh, that your project, your why is bigger than yourself and that you empower people to grow. But it's tremendously rewarding. And uh, I think it's a journey that is absolute worthwhile pursuing. Oh, such great advice, such great thoughts uh, coming from someone who's been doing it for a long time. Uh, Frank, I really, I really love this message. Um, how can people, if people are interested in maybe meeting you and, and asking you some questions or maybe learning more about your company, how can our listeners find out more about you and, and your company? Yeah, let's start with uh, Simrise, uh, which I believe is a fantastic company and a great place to work. I think obviously it's a website and uh, then there's the annual report, right? And uh, I would encourage anyone who wants to find out anything about any company to go to the annual report, but because all the secrets are somewhere in there, right? Okay. So you find yeah. out so much and that's the same for Simrise. With regards to me, if anyone wants to get in touch, uh, look up my LinkedIn profile and uh, it's probably best and easiest to contact me via LinkedIn and I'll be back in touch with you. Fantastic. We're going to put links in the show notes for those resources. Again, if something in Frank's message really stands out to you, reach out to him. I really highly encourage you to reach out uh, the reason we bring guests on this show is for you to learn, but also to uh, connect. If it, if something Frank has talked about in terms of career, in terms of leadership, in terms of uh, managing your career over the years, uh, like Frank has done successfully, then uh, yeah, reach out and learn. And also uh, t check out Simrise. I mean, this is kind of, you know, the companies behind the companies are always interesting to me. B2B companies are always interesting to me. I work in a B2B company and and so, sometimes you have, you have a hard time explaining what you do to people. What do you do? Well, I make the things that go into other things. And, and I love B2B <laughs> business. I've been in it a long time. So, uh, and, and so check out Simrise. That's a, it, it's an exciting company, growing company and successful company. Uh, and again, it's the kind of company that, uh, that Frank has been able to operate in and be uh, culturally aligned uh, to what he believes is correct leadership. And it sounds like the company accepts it as well, which is a great, great place to be. So again, we'll put links in the show notes for those resources and check them out. So Frank, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for sharing this unique perspective from a corporate standpoint. Uh, I've learned a lot. I know our leader, our, our listeners have as, as well. Yeah, thank you very much, John. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.